and is recognized for her expertise in trauma and infant and early childhood mental health. She has a particular interest in, in and focus on families struggling with substance and opioid use disorders. With support from a variety of federal agencies and other foundations, Professor Paris has developed and evaluated multiple attachment-based interventions targeted at vulnerable families with young children. Her work is driven by the desire to develop effective and accessible interventions that are feasible in community settings, are culturally responsive, benefit families with young children and make good sense in the field. Ruth is currently evaluating BRIGHT, Building Resilience Through Intervention, Growing Healthier Together, a dyadic therapeutic parenting intervention offered within substance use treatment programs. Welcome, Professor Paris. We're so thrilled that you could join us today to share your wisdom and expertise. Thank you so much, Alice, and for that nice um, and generous introduction. Um, I am delighted to be here with you today. The only thing that would make me more delighted is if I was actually in Wisconsin with you. <laughs> that would be definitely more fun rather than looking out my window, which has a very slushy mix of snow and rain at this very moment. So, um, okay. Uh, and so with no further ado, I'm gonna share my screen. Take a second to get this set up. Okay, looking good? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk to you for a while here and hopefully we'll have lots of time also for discussion. And the topic for today is substance use trauma and parenting and the challenges uh, that are involved actually in that and the intervention that is a possibility to make a difference for both the parent and the child. So here's what I'm going <clears> to <throat> talk about for a bit. Um, I'm going to give you really a brief overview of maternal substance use, and that is emphasize the brief because there's a lot to share and to talk about, and but we're not going to get to talk all about it today. I'm going to help you think about the uh, intersection of uh, substance use and parents, the trauma that is involved, and the actual parenting practices. So what happens when you put them all together? And then I'm gonna tell you a bit about the Bright Intervention and give you a case example. Okay, so here's starting from a little bit of the beginning of numbers. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a context, and I imagine there are many of you in the, in the audience who know this, but I'm gonna go over it for everybody, that um, these are some of the numbers we have most recently. In 2018, there were approximately more than 20 million people over the age of 12 who were actually diagnosed with a substance use disorder. And because of that, not surprisingly, we've had upwards of 800,000 people that have died um, between about a 20, 21 year period from a drug overdose. And as you must know that the death rate is heavily driven by opioids. Most of the people I'm gonna be talking about today are women. And so to try and understand where women fit into the picture, we see that close to 20 million women have used illicit drugs in the past year. And um, since 2002 to just a few years ago, the opioid use among women has actually doubled. So there's a, the, the rate of use among women is actually rising quicker than among the general population or among men. Um, pregnant women, are also involved and the rate increased of pregnant women using illicit substances going up in just one year from 4.7% to 6.3%. So that's concerning and it has continued to rise. We're in this pandemic, we've been in this pandemic for way too long. And again, you may know that um, there has been an increase in substance use. CDC says about a 13% increase in substance use to cope with stress and a, a you know, subsequent increase in overdose that they um, list as about 18%. So problem is happening. It's been increasing actually. I will just add to this, the difficulty is that what we're seeing in substance use treatment it, during the pandemic has been less accessing of substance use treatment, particularly residential programs and other types of treatment programs. So that's a, a whole nother conversation that maybe we can have after I share my things with you. So um, we know that the rate of overdose death among women has gone up. We also know that opioid use disorder has gone up in pregnant women four times 
okay? Um, from 1999 to 2014, again, very, very concerning. And of course, if there's pregnant women, there are babies who are exposed um, with what we now call neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. You may know it as NAS. Um, and we've seen a tremendous increase, four times as many infants born with NAS. We're also seeing a lot of racial disparity within um, Black and Latinx communities in terms of access to services. So we're seeing um, much more op opioid use in Black and Latinx populations. Um, there is a lack of evidence-based treatments for people of color in general within the substance use world. And we do know that Black people were less likely to receive treatment within 30 days of opioid-related overdose, and particularly less likely to receive a medication like buprenorphine, which nowadays in my region is in many hospitals is typically given if somebody comes in with an overdose. And we're seeing that Black people are not given this option as often as white people. Again, I'm particularly interested in women and particularly women of childbearing age. And we're seeing that fewer women of color are in substance use treatment programs. And some of the reasons that people speculate is that there's been a history of stigma for black women, particularly during crack cocaine epidemic. I'm sure some of you may remember and some of you may have heard about um, sort of crack babies and the images most often of an African-American baby. Um, a lot of fear of imprisonment and losing child custody, which does happen at a higher rate for women of color in the United States. The other thing that people take note of is that white women are more likely to seek help. And so they're filling up the available treatment programs, meaning that there's not enough space for everyone who might need it, particularly women of color. And so they have less access, Black women. We have a small study going on in Boston right now at a clinic where I um, do some work and have recruited for a study. And here, um, the researchers are finding that stigma and poor self-worth are associated that are associated with substance use disorders contribute to people not seeking care. And these are Black women. And the belief also that they're going to talk about this with people in their families, and so they're not as likely to go into a treatment program, as well as they're not seeing you know, people like them in the programs. So in terms of staff, and so the staff needs to diversify to be more responsive to the needs of um, people of color who might want to use their programs. So um, it's a disturbing image, and I will say that there may be other disturbing images in my talk, um, that this is from a USA Today <clears throat> cover story about what it's like for a baby to um, be born exposed to opioids, and you can read it yourself. It's, it's very um, alarmist, and again, I, don't, I think it is concerning for these babies to be born um, having been exposed in utero to opioids and other substances. I'm just drawing out that this is a very dramatic, and if you were a mom who had a substance use disorder and you were looking at this, it, you couldn't help but feel bad about yourself. Um, the now symptoms for babies um, <clears throat> are, can be very dramatic and they can be um, really concerning for everyone and they can be very mild. So it's, a, it's quite a range. Um, there was a scale that was used and still is probably used in many places called the Finnegan scale developed by somebody named Finnegan, um, who's a lovely person. And just people, babies would get a score, right? So irritability, poor feeding, seizures, sleep problems, vomiting, et cetera. And they would get a score and then that would determine how much medication they would get, morphine, methadone, et cetera. Things have been changing, luckily, and there is a new um, intervention for these babies called Eat Sleep Console that was developed in a number of hospitals, um, Boston University being one of them, and that uh, <clears throat> instead of using opioids simply based on the Finnegan score, the Eat Sleep Console approach um, is a functional tool. And so it uses really the mother's relationship with the infant to care and comfort the baby. And so it's it beyond even the mother that there might be um, you know, nurses or other people. So instead of the baby being whisked away to the nursery immediately, or the baby might be taken away to just assess how they were doing, but they would room in with their mothers uh, and the mothers would be encouraged to breastfeed. And the, you know, the babies were certainly watched by the staff and the mother and the babies were watched together. But even if the mother was discharged from the hospital, she was encouraged to the baby as much as possible. And lo and behold, they found that the amount of methadone that a baby needed was much less. And uh, we had a reduction from 30 days 
uh, average stay for the babies in weaning off of substances to um, something like, I don't know, between six and nine days. Within a year, it was quite dramatic, the change. And so it's being uh, replicated in many, many hospitals. And I would say that, you know, this is an attachment-based approach because it's building on the relationship between the mother and the baby. And it's also assuming that the mother really wants to parent her baby, which has been our experience. So keep that in mind, attachment and attachment-based approaches. So I mentioned that, again, um, the newspapers, particularly for many, many years, had very, very alarming, um, uh, you know, articles. Here's another one that's from the Boston Globe that says cases soar of newborns with opiate addiction. And so um, the, we know from many, many studies and from clinical experience that pregnancy serves as a motivator for treatment. So um, women who um, are pregnant and have a substance use disorder, that being pregnant usually gets people to say, oh, I don't wanna do this to my baby. I don't want to damage my baby at all. I have to get into treatment. Um, there's also the heightened public concern about newborns that are exposed to substances. And so some states, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, have developed many new programs for mothers and infants who have substance use disorders. And I applaud those states because it's made a huge difference. At the same time, as you can tell from the last newspaper story I showed and from this new newspaper story, there's a lot of shame and guilt that is part of the experience for these moms because there's about, you know, it's about the worst thing that you can be is a, a mother with substance use disorder. Um, and so these, both of these things, more concern, more treatment options, lots of shame and guilt make for challenges to treatment engagement, right? Because somebody might know I've got to get some help, but who can I tell and where do I go? And what happens if I tell and I'm going to be able to keep my child, et cetera, et cetera. Those of you involved in child welfare, you know, this is um, a big percentage of child welfare cases. So here's a, a quote from a mom in one of our studies and a little bit to just unpack this idea of shame and guilt. And she said, I got pregnant with my second son when I was in the grips of my disease. I couldn't stop. I thought I was the only woman on the face of this earth scumbag enough to use while pregnant. So I didn't know who to tell. I thought if I told somebody, I'd be walking around with like the letter A on my chest. Another mom said, it was terrible to see my baby suffer from my actions, from, you know, what I put him through. It was terrible to see the effects and still suffer the consequences of that disease. So again, a lot of shame about the experience and a lot of guilt about what has happened for her baby. Um, the experience of judgment is also intrinsic here. And so here's a mom who said, I always felt like if I was to tell a doctor or to tell somebody that I'd be so judged and looked at like a piece of crap for having a newborn and having a drug addiction. So again, the desire to keep it secret at the same time as wanting to get help is, you know, it's quite, it's a quandary. I just had nurses constantly judging me. I had one come in and the nurse was saying to the baby, oh, you poor baby, that's awful that you have to detox like this. And this mom felt like she was saying it in front of her in order to make her feel badly. So here's a bit of a, um, a policy look from a national level. Um, and I tried to get the data here for Wisconsin as best as I could. So this is from the Guttmacher Institute. And for those of you interested, it's a great website that tracks a lot of policy around pregnancy. Um, there are 23 states and the District of Columbia, so less than half the states in the United States, consider substance use during pregnancy to be child abuse under civil child welfare statutes and three considered grounds for civil commitment. Wisconsin's one of them. So in other words, a woman who has a substance use disorder during pregnancy can be civilly committed um, in your state. And maybe you know more about that than I do. Um, it's not true in Massachusetts, so I haven't experienced this. 25 states in the District of Columbia require healthcare professionals to report suspected prenatal drug use, and that's true in Wisconsin. And eight states require them to test for prenatal drug exposure. So this is even before the child is born. Um, 19 states have created or funded drug treatment programs, not enough, but they target pregnant women. 17 states and DC provide pregnant women with priority access. And here's where Wisconsin comes in ahead, both state funded and private programs. Wisconsin gives pregnant women priority access. <clears throat> 
and 10 states prohibit um, uh, publicly funded programs from discriminating against pregnant women. Unfortunately, Wisconsin isn't one of them. And this means that there's a woman wants to go into a drug treatment program. And in, again, in 40 states in the United States, they can be prohibited from going. And that means that people say, well, we can't take pregnant women because we don't know what to do. And it's specialized and we don't have that specialty. So again, not sure where to go. Um, once a child is born, in order to receive federal child abuse prevention funds, the states have to provide, have providers in each of those states, 50 of them, need to notify Child Protective Services when um, a baby is born and they know the baby's infected by illegal substance use. Now, I'm underlining the word illegal here, but unfortunately, um, women who are on NAT, which now we think of as medication for addiction treatment, which is typically methadone or buprenorphine, there's some others as well, is that in many, many states, it's beginning to change a little bit. Women who've been on medication for three, four, five years and are stable and doing well um, and are not using illegal substances because MAT is not illegal, still have um, child abuse reports filed on them once the baby is born. And this is a, a very significant um, challenge and uh, big issue and big conversations that we've been having in our state. Okay, so that's a lot of lot I just shared, but it gives you a bit about the background. And um, let's move in to thinking about what else is important to understand in order to help make a difference here for, um, for the parents and for their children. So this is something that may be familiar for those of you that work in the field of substance use. And this is a really, really um, very, very brief uh, look at the brain, not my drawings here, luckily. Um, so common drugs of addiction, and the images talk specifically about cocaine, um, impact multiple areas in the brain, but particularly the dopamine circuitry uh, is an important one aspect that gets affected by substances. And essentially there's a flood of dopamine. So you could see that when you're eating something you like, like chocolate, you get a little bit of a positive dopamine if you like chocolate. When something like cocaine, you get a rush of dopamine. That process, and that's true with heroin, with other opioids as well, is that the brain is essentially hijacked and gets used to that, um, the rush of dopamine, which reinforces right, certain behaviors because certain feelings, um, excuse me, come along with it. So what does that mean for a mom who has a history of substance use disorder? Is that the pleasure involved in parenting and particularly early parenting, if you think about that, there's physical contact with the baby, the uh, early emotional connections, watching the child's development, you know, skin to skin contact, all of those just amazing things that happen in early in a newborn's life and in a relationship with a parent, those are not necessarily, um, you know, the dopamine's not being released at quite the level that, um, that heroin might do. And so that would mean that it's harder to have those pleasurable experiences. And that subsequently makes it also difficult to tolerate the challenges of parenting. So the 3 a.m. crying and needy infants of which many of these babies are, can be needier than even typical babies, that if you don't have the good stuff and you're not feeling all of the pleasures in parenting, it makes it in particular difficult to tolerate the challenges. And also on top of that is um, difficulties with emotion regulation, which I'll tell you about. So it's a physiologically, and I really want to emphasize this for those of you that have interactions with um, mothers who have history of substance use disorder is that this is really challenging for women to feel the good things in parenting. And the brain heals, luckily, and this over time can change, but I, I just really want to encourage people to keep this in mind. The other thing that can happen, and now we're talking about the relationship, is that there's that dysregulation that I told you about. And so um, the stress and reward circuits um, are challenged in the way that I explained. And so what does that mean? Um, for the mom may have difficulty discerning the cues that the baby is. So there have been studies, Helena Rutherford at um, Yale has done many studies and there's some others as well that really show that these moms don't respond as quickly at a, at a, you know, at a um, neurological level. Uh, the brain is not firing in the way that the neurons are inhabiting in the way they're not recognizing those cues, both faces and sounds. So what does that mean for the baby? 
right? For a crying baby. So a crying baby is crying, 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 not getting the response that they would want in order to help them feel better. They might stop crying, right? Or they may begin to miscue the parent, not knowing how the parent is going to respond, needing to cry more to get a response from the parent, or maybe realizing that crying isn't going to get you anything. So you begin to see a relationship that's developing that is compromising um, the attachment formation, which I think is, again, another very, very important thing to keep in mind. What else is going on for parents um, in terms of the lifestyle or what comes along with substance use is, is often there's a lot of trauma, a lot of trauma in a person's history. There's also um, their own experience of child maltreatment. Um, and there's also, um, the experience of trauma that comes along with uh, substance use, in particular illicit substance use, which often has um, issues of housing insecurity, food insecurity, interpersonal violence, many other things. Um, so emotion regulation is another issue that is common to uh, someone who has a trauma history and also someone who has a substance use history. So keep emotion regulation in mind as we move forward. So a little bit of a diagram again, something that you, most of you probably know is if you, you can start sort of anywhere here, but if you start with a, a trauma and for many of the moms that we work with, we're really talking about multiple traumas and which cause emotional upheaval and, and perhaps a use of substances or a misuse of substances in order to calm that emotional upheaval. But we know that the substances, you know, uh, uh, support a decreased ability to learn new skills and to process traumatic material. So if you're squashing those feelings with substances, you're not gonna have a chance to deal with the original trauma and squashing the feelings, again, can lead you to use more substances, right? Because the trauma doesn't ever get dealt with. And then the more substances leads to more trauma. So we've got a pretty bad um, trauma and addiction cycle that is hard to break, but I would say you can go in at any, there's many ports of entry here. So um, not to be disheartened. These are some of the things that parental substance misuse are often associated with in the literature. And so we know that the vast majority of women um, experience their pregnancies in an unplanned way. Although today I was talking with one of the clinician who works in one of my studies and she talked about a woman who was intentionally um, getting pregnant and was very, very, um, you know, really wanted to be pregnant because she knew that that was the only way she was gonna stop using. So that's, that's complicated, right? Putting that on the baby right away, but um, something to think about. Um, history of child trauma is almost always true. Um, there's a lot of current trauma associated with it. There's lots of life stressors, which I mentioned. Um, a history of poor attachment relationships. Many of the women in our studies have um, parents who have alcohol use disorder and other substance use. And um, again, lots of trauma. And the mental health co-occurring disorders are, are very, very common, depression and anxiety in particular. Okay, I, I gave you a lot of information there. I do it on time. Um, putting together the pieces. Okay, so let's look and see. So we've got, we start with in utero exposure and there's a lot of implications, including I told you about neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome for those having used opioids. And there's some data about ADHD, there's data about cognitive development, many other things just due to in utero exposure. Some of the most recent um, papers are looking at seeing that these findings, the long-term findings are debated because we don't know if it's because of the exposure or because of what happens after the baby's born. So I'm just holding in mind for those of you who are social workers, which I assume most of you are, is that the place that we come in is after the babies are born and that there's a possibility to intervene and to support these families that could make a difference in the lives of these babies. The caregiving environment, that's where we come in. And so there are lots of documented studies that show difficulties for many of these mothers and fathers, difficulties with emotion regulation. Remember I said, hold on to that. Um, so that looks like some challenges in maternal responsiveness, sometimes due to what I described before about um, what's happening at a uh, brain level, um, emotional involvement, withdrawal, intrusiveness, difficulty in reciprocity. These are things that, again, I encourage you to look at Helen Rutherford's work because there's a, a lot to learn there. 
Um, again, child welfare, lots of involvement with child welfare. And so the data are different depending on the state, but we see that anywhere between a third and two thirds of children involved with child welfare have one parent at least who um, has a substance use disorder. And so we have seen with the increase in neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome that there's also um, an escalation of the number of children who were in child welfare. So that's been happening um, for sure for the last 10 years. And we see that a lot in our state. And it just again, important in putting all the pieces together when you're thinking of substance use trauma um, and, and the child and the relationships involved. Um, many of these parents come to the parenting role without the experience of a secure attachment. And so they can then recreate the same problematic attachment in their relationships with their children. And so the difficulty of acting and serving as a secure base for their infant and growing child is challenged. And that's, that's where the work lies. That's right, right there. That's where the clinical work. Um, I like to quote a colleague in Finland who has said that um, this is important because we're thinking about the difficult regulatory partners. So we've got a parent and an infant. And so you can see that she says the substance exposed mother and child are difficult regulatory partners for each other. So the baby can have an apparent ability to regulate his or her states due to the in utero exposure. Maybe this baby needs a little more help. At the same time, the mother has a reduced capacity because of all the things I just told you about to read the child's signals. And so here you have the combination of a, a vicious negative cycle. Oftentimes that mom feels very frustrated and she could either become more intrusive or withdraw from the interaction. And we see a, a great risk for child maltreatment in, in those relationships. Okay, things to remember. In utero exposure, it's just one possible cause of the sum of the problematic outcomes for children, okay? So it's, it's not a done deal. And um, we know from longitudinal studies of some other substances, we don't have them in opioids for long, for long studies, that it, it doesn't mean just because of exposure to cocaine, you know, it doesn't set your trajectory for life. There's lots of variation there. Um, it's a complex in, interplay of relationships caregivers, caregiving practices, the home environment, they're all involved as well as the, the broader environment that we live in. I mentioned earlier that there's disparity in access to treatment services. And so if it's a black child growing up and what their experiences are might be different from a white child growing up in terms of access to services. And that's extremely important. Um, with all of that, it's still important to remember that these children are at high risk for things that could include depression, impulsivity, self-destructive behaviors, and, and cognitive, social, and emotional developmental problems. So I, I share with you the challenges and also the fact that there's places to intervene. And the moms themselves, they want to be good mothers, right? They really, really want to be good mothers. And again, um, I can't say this for every, most of the 200 plus moms that we've had contact with are, are striving to be good mothers. Um, and caregiving varies. So it's not as if you can say, oh, she has a substance use disorder and therefore she's X. It, it, we see a really wide range of women depending on where they are in their recovery, depending on how many children they've had removed, depending on how many resources they've had, depending on family supports, depending on a lot of different things. And yet, you know, they are kind of lumped into a group and um, there's a much greater risk of losing custody of their children um, because of this risk of maltreatment. And so something for us to keep in mind. I told you to, to remember emotion regulation. And so I'm coming back to that now again. Um, we need to regulate our emotional states, you know, women and men in order to be sensitive parents and to promote optimal infant attachment, because for those of you in the audience that are parents, you know that it's about one of the most challenging things that you can do. Um, we do also know that early parenting experiences that support the mother-infant bond, so things like breastfeeding or close physical contact, cuddling, they can actually upregulate neural networks 
with which help the mom, right? So remember again, the brain image that I showed that good experiences, close breastfeeding, cuddling, holding can actually help the neural networks and help the moms um, interpret the infant cues, okay? And help her regulate her emotions. Um, this consistent caregiving throughout early development shapes the child's ability to regulate emotion, right? If there's somebody that's predictably there or some buddies that are predictably there, they know that when they get upset, they can be soothed and there's a co-regulation process that's happening. Eventually that becomes their own ability to regulate. We know, and I'm gonna to talk to you in a minute about reflective functioning, that parents with higher reflective functioning are better able to regulate their own emotions in a caregiving experience in particular. So these are parents who have the ability to reflect on what's happening in their own experiences, in their feelings and behaviors, and they're able to reflect on their child. Emotion regulation is key. It's a key component for substance use treatment. It's a key component in substance use disorders, and it's a key component in trying to make a difference for these moms, dads, and babies. So what about the parenting programs that we know about? Um, oftentimes, at least in our state, when there's a services plan developed um, for a family that's involved in child welfare, it's sort of parenting classes are listed on there. And I don't wanna be dismissive of all parenting classes because I think there's lots of good ones out there and many of them that are effective. Unfortunately, the ones that are very skills-based are not necessarily the best for these families. Um, because they haven't demonstrated changes in the kinds of parent-child interactions that we're interested in, in terms of promoting child development. It also, they also assume that the parent can tolerate the kinds of emotional stress of parenting, and they don't address that, right? All the stuff that I just told you about in terms of the reward system for the parent isn't addressed in some of the typical um, skills-based training. And it also doesn't address the, the whole area of internal mental, mental representations for the parent, which is something that an attachment-based program would. So we, and there's a growing number of we's, um, hence the citation at the bottom there, which was published in Children in Your Services Review a couple of years ago, is that relational approaches that um, come from infant mental health that are attachment-based and emphasize affect and help the parent invest in their child rather than in substances, right? So if you get reinforced and you begin to feel good in, as a parent and in your relationship with your child and that you can actually feel that, that has um, a positive effect, keeps parents in recovery, um, helps build reflective functioning, helps the parent to see who that child is uh, for real and helps them attune and create an optimal environment for the child to grow. So this is again, back to reflective functioning. This is a very quick explanation, but <clears throat> for those of you that have not heard the term, we talk about parental reflective functioning as the ability to reflect on and understand the mental state of yourself and of your child. Okay, so if that's a six month old, that's a rough thing to do, right? So you have to be able to um, begin to think about what could that child be experiencing. So we've had moms say, um, she's crying, this is to a four month old baby, because she hates me and she knows I'm a bad mother. Now, most of you know that most four month old babies don't cry because they know that their mother is a bad mother and that, <clears throat> and that they hate them. That's just not what a four month old baby, but this is a misattribution that a, a mom who feels particularly bad about herself and, and really doesn't know about parenting. Um, and so um, an intervener using an approach that would build reflective functioning would slow down that process and wonder a little bit with the mom about where that idea is coming from and where the feeling and what she's feeling at that moment. What's it like when the baby is crying? How does she feel about herself? How does she feel about herself as a parent? And then using some developmental guidance might help the mother understand that what the baby might be experiencing at four months old if they're crying. Um, so that's what I said in the next bullet. And we do know from growing literature that better parental reflective functioning can mediate negative effects of substance misuse and particularly of trauma and mental health challenges. We really see that trauma in many ways overrides in my studies, the impact of substance use, partly because the trauma symptoms for many women in recovery, they're not using at that moment. And so what they've got left is the symptoms 
from the many traumas that they've experienced. Okay, now we're moving a bit into intervention. And this is an intervention that I've been involved with since 2009 in collaboration with many folks in the community. And um, Bright One, which was funded by SAMHSA and involved three different, two different community agencies and me and my team at um, the USSW, um, take, took place in family residential programs. In Bright Two, we moved into outpatient programs, continued to develop. So that means that we offered Bright as um, an attachment-based intervention, as an, um, an enhancement to residential substance use treatment, to opioid treatment programs, which were basically methadone treatment. And currently, we're still in Bright Three, where we're in a number of different programs. And again, it's a discrete intervention that's offered to the parent and the parent-child dyad. And um, it's in the context of substance use treatment. So it is not a frank substance use treatment program. It's done with mostly women, although some men, who are already in some sort of substance use treatment. We were able to um, receive funding a number of years ago from HRSA to actually run a pragmatic randomized control trial. So we're still finishing that up. And that is in a perinatal setting. So we actually recruit people during pregnancy and begin the process of thinking about the baby while they're in treatment um, for substance use disorder and going to actually a prenatal clinic that takes care of women specifically with substance use disorder. So the 90 plus percent of the women are on some sort of medication. And I'm just listing down here all of my colleagues who um, together have been developing and fine tuning Right, and there's more names in there that I couldn't get everybody in, but I want to credit everybody because this really was a team effort. And this is my little image of, to give you a very quick, and I'm going to break this down in the next number of slides. Um, so, what are the things we think about when we think about primarily the mother and the baby? We've got, you know, the substance use history and the treatment, hopefully, mental health issues. The parenting, right? We address specifically what are the challenges in parenting and what are the risks to the baby in terms of maltreatment in the parent-child relationship. And of course, we're wanting that baby to develop in the best way that she or he can. Um, we, what do we do? And I'm gonna, again, break this down, but we're focused on the relationship in terms of pleasure and play. Uh, there's developmental guidance involved. We want the parent to be protective of the child. Um, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, there's an emphasis on helping the parents understand the feelings of the child, the possible feelings, particularly in a pre-verbal child. And um, there's a lot of emotional support involved. It's supportive all the way through. And again, to this point of emotion regulation, encouraging emotion regulation, encouraging helping the mom manage her own feelings and begin to think about how to help her child manage feelings building reflective functioning, the capacity to think about what's happening for you, what's happening for your baby, and always providing concrete assistance. Many of these moms are in crisis a lot of the time, and you can't do any of that other work while you're in crisis because you don't have a place to live. What do we want to change? Big goals we have. We want to help the parent-child relationship and parenting. We want to make a difference in maternal and mental health. We want to promote the infant social emotional development and reduce the risk of maltreatment. And we want the mom to maintain her sobriety. So what we did in developing this intervention is we started out with many of the principles and ideas in child-parent psychotherapy, which some of you may know is an evidence-based practice focusing on parent-child dyad and specifically addresses um, child trauma and parent trauma. But the lead is really comes in from the child. Um, because that was really a child entry point, we were thinking more of a parent or parent-child port of entry. And so we were using best infant mental health practices for parents in recovery from substance use. And lucky for us, by 2009, there were some people like Nancy Suckman at Yale who were already doing some of this work and a few other people. Also had to think about the treatment site, had to think about how old the child was, how long we could intervene, et cetera. And so the expansions really came in what I've already begun to mention to you, which is thinking about emotion regulation and regulatory capacities, which you know some other um, parenting, therapeutic parenting interventions had not thought about. And again, on building reflective functioning as a really important mechanism for 
um, modifying the intergenerational transmission of problematic attachment. Okay. So again, I think I shared a little bit about this already, but when we talk about facilitating shared experiences of pleasure and play, that's really what we do. It's dyadic work. We want the mom to experience the baby, to play with the baby, to play with the growing child. It's neglected to say this starts prenatally in some versions and goes through age five. So you might be on the floor playing with a three-year-old or a four-year-old and the mom. Um, you're really exploring the relationships in the mom's past and in the present and in the relationship with the child, beginning to put those pieces together, what's happening in the past, what's happening in the present, how do they fit together? Um, again, I mentioned many times helping the mom contain and regulate strong affect, which would be you know, in, in a real life session about what's going on for the mom and, and helping her in that moment. And again, building reflective functioning would happen through um, asking lots of questions that are reflective and help the mom to think about what do you think about that? Where did that come from? Why do you think that happened for yourself, for your child, et cetera? It's a lot of reflective questions. This is a little bit more breaking down. So in the engagement process with Bright, it's very flexible. Um, if the mom comes in needing some concrete assistance, that's where you start. It's a good social work adage, starting where clients are at. Um, talked about emotion regulation. Lots of bearing witness to processes and experiences, particularly just I'm very in touch. Most recently, we've had um, lots of moms who have had their children taken from them after birth um, because of the pandemic and because it's been difficult to monitor children. And so there's been a lot of work around what that is like after they've worked so hard on their treatment and done so well that regardless of what's happened, the um, child welfare felt that it was safer for the child to be put into foster care. And so lots of sharing and hearing and thinking through that experience. And we believe that you can build reflective functioning um, through any kinds of conversations, right? And so it doesn't only, I mean, the clinician is always keeping the child in mind and is always bringing the child into the conversation, even if the child is not present in the session. But it's also important that a mom can build reflective functioning by thinking about anything in her life. And some more um, strategies, which you should be familiar with. So that's validating feelings and a lot of recovery support, encouraging problem solving, this is the work in terms of the mother-baby work and um, <clears throat> reflective supervision. I can't speak highly enough of that. Obviously, this is challenging work because um, these moms and some dads are, um, you know, struggling, right? They're struggling with their own recovery and they really want to be parents and people are watching them being parents and even the best parents don't want to be watched as parents. So as a clinician, you really need a place to think reflectively about what you're doing and to have the support that you need. Okay, this is the time when the recording should stop. Have they have increased during the pandemic and they present lots of challenges to optimal parenting for mothers and for fathers. Uh, right, which is what I shared with you about is a relationship-based um, approach that supports recovery. It's not a substance use treatment. Um, but it does support recovery and hopefully works to end intergenerational transmission of trauma and substance use. That's a big goal. Um, it's been offered an enhancement to substance use treatment. And so there's lots of focus on trauma, lots of focus on attachment, and hopefully um, involves parents and their children. Uh, we think, and again, it's a growing we, that parenting intervention focused on emotion regulation and building reflective functioning have the potential to improve parenting capacities and the parent-child relationship and child development for parents with substance use disorders and to help them maintain their sobriety, which we think is going to make a difference for them in the long run and for sure for their child. Um, we see this as having a tremendous impact for child welfare in that if parents are having you know, greater sensitivity to their child's needs, their parenting skills are truly improving um, beyond what I think a parenting class can offer, that more children are staying with their parents and out of foster care. 
So where are we going with this? We are continuing to develop. We're in the process of writing guidelines for the intervention, and we've been doing dissemination in talks like this and in some more um, el elaborate trainings that are involved in multi-day. So you can hear much more about the intervention and learn about it. And we have been um, doing bright now in home-based programs uh, out of perinatal settings and in, in uh, prenatal clinics and postnatal clinics. Um, and so we're looking to our results from our randomized trial to see you know, some of the ways that we're able to establish a bit more of an evidence base for the intervention. Okay, so I think it's time for questions and comments. And I just wanna thank you all for listening today. I know I really appreciate it. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So uh, we have a couple of questions so far and people um, that are watching, you can feel free to put more questions in the Q&A. Uh, the first question, uh, Professor Paris was, are the recommendations on how a parent who has recovered from substance use disorder should discuss their addiction or recovery with their older children? Mm -hmm. For example, if a mother of a teenager wants to share her experiences with her children to discourage them from experimenting, are there key points to share? Sure. Um, great question. And um, I will say that I'm also a family therapist and have worked with lots of older kids as well. But um, uh, one thing I just want to say is that, you know, I think that in the world of recovery, people would say that one is in some ways always in recovery. So it isn't ever something that sort of is fully behind you because um, that's the parlance, and even if it's been 5, 10, or 15 years, so hopefully a person in recovery is continuing to think about themselves in that way and continuing to, to manage the things that unfortunately, um, you know, addictions are really, really challenging, and um, they can reappear at different points in people's lives. I'm sure you've heard stories about people who hadn't used or hadn't smoked for 15 years, for 20 years, and then sort of started doing it again, so I just wanted to say that at first. And you know, I, in, in my work as a family therapist, I very much support honest communication um, between parents and children. Um, that said, I think that, um, so I don't know whether in your question is, do you, are there things that a parent should hide? Um, are there negative things? I don't think scare tactics are useful. Um, sort of the scared straight kinds of approaches. I think honest sharing of what it was like for me, what happened for me, what, what I did. I mean, you know, obviously age appropriate details um, and sort of some basic information depending on a child's age and then letting the child ask the questions. So let the child lead with what they wanna know about and what they wanna understand. And the parent has to feel ultimately comfortable with what they're sharing. And if there's still a lot of shame and guilt around some things and they don't feel ready to share that, they should be mindful of that as well. So I hope I, that's a very quick, you know, to a complicated, um, something that's complicated that I would hope somebody would actually maybe seek a little more professional help in order to do something like that. Thank you. Another question uh, from Lisa. What types of endorphin increasing activities does Bright prescribe in its interventions? Sure, that's good. Um, so we don't, you know, we're not a, we're not a prescription <laughs> in general, but we do support, um, you know, the kinds of things that are supported in really recovery programs. So that would include all sorts of mindfulness activities, exercise, um, healthy eating, um, you know, things that would be uh, yoga is has happening a lot in substance use treatment programs. All of those, I think, are endorphin increasing. And so um, we support the work that many of the women are doing within their recovery programs and tailor them to, you know, you have a little baby. And so it's going to be maybe a little difficult to um, attend a yoga class. <laughs> um, but uh, we support you know, taking walks, doing all different kinds of things that are going to, to build endorphins. I hope that answers the question. I, I'm curious, because I raised a question for people and I'm, given I'm not seeing any, anything in the Q&A now, whether people would want to share, I guess they could put it in the Q&A, just about what it was like to watch those videos and what they thought about in terms of the first video when the mom was younger, the baby was younger, and what it felt like to watch and what they thought the mom was experiencing, what the baby was experiencing. And then 
anything else they want to share about watching the videos? Because I think there's a lot there. Doesn't have to be a question. It can be just sort of a more of a comment and So someone comments, she seemed very stressed, like, what am I doing wrong? Sam says, it was difficult to watch the first video. The mom seemed pretty stressed out and putting myself in the shoes of watching over a fussy baby, I felt uncomfortable. Yeah. The person says she seemed detached. Yeah. Another comment about quiet and detached during the first video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our audience can't see these, which is why I'm reading them out loud. Yeah, 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 that's good. <laughs> the mom seemed lost and didn't know how to deal with the baby. I would be so self-conscious if I were here knowing I was being watched as a parent. I would feel fear being judged for not being able to calm the baby. First video, mom trying lots of things. Mom struggling to read cues. If baby could talk, I really like when I'm cuddled and close to you. Right. Yeah. Good observations. I think when I've shown this video before, some people have like jumped out of their seat, kind of wanting to say, pick the baby up, just hold the baby, you know, just like hold the baby and close to you. Um, the mom was not given instructions to sit, right? She could have gotten up if she wanted to, but I think you're tuning into it, it is anxiety producing um, to have somebody videotaping you with a crying baby. She didn't seem distressed though in that way, right? She wasn't distressed. She just was, I think, as I think some people said, um, detached. And I think actually what she was was more depressed at that time and wasn't really sure what to do. Um, but I think if the baby could talk, he would have ideas. Are there other things in there, Alice? A couple more things. Let's see. She went to the same two options, patting the back and the nook. Uh, didn't stand up with baby or turn for direction. The second video, she seemed more engaged. Uh, baby would also say, give me a minute to let this work before you try something else. Yeah. Good awareness. First video, mom seemed more focused on being a good parent or doing the right thing versus reading the baby's cues. Mom seemed more comfortable in the later videos. Baby looked like it needed more closeness from mom. Mm -hmm. the comment, it was interesting to watch this and compare with my own business, my own experiences in supervising visits such as this. This training mm -hmm. has been very eye-opening on what mom might've been experiencing and how her brain chemistry might be playing a role. Someone else says it was upsetting to watch baby cry and it felt like baby just wanted to be hugged. I know that feeling. I was taken back to my childhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good awarenesses. I, I think that um, for those of us involved in, you know, child welfare work and infant parent work, crying babies are very evocative for everybody and um, for their own parent, but for all of us. And so it's, um, uh, and important to be able to reflect on what you experience when you're in that and what you would have wanted and what you have done as a parent, what you what it brings you back to as a child. I mean, there's so many things, which is my earlier comment about reflective supervision. You need a place to talk about that. And if I had say something in, in child welfare, I, I would encourage that type of supervision, which I, I don't know what it's like in Wisconsin, but it's not the... Um, it's not the typical in Massachusetts. And I think that uh, reflective supervision is so, so, so important because the work that telephone workers are doing is so, so, so important and so, so, so difficult. Here's another question. Um, it, Sam asks, is it better to treat mental health or substance use first if there are barriers and you have to choose one? Such a good question. I would say, mm, both, both, both. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's in one of those depends questions. I think people, you know, it's really, thinking of my colleagues, people in the substance use field would say, you know, that the mental health disorder is probably secondary to the substance use. So if you don't treat the substance use, you're never going to get to the mental health disorder. People in the mental health field might say, you know, mental health is probably what's fueling the substance use substance use problem and if you deal with, with the underlying so that's that's what um 
partly because I work in close contact in with the substance use field and substance use treatment, I do think that you got to get the substance use sort of a little bit of a handle and you have to minimize the substance use to be able to get somebody to address, I think, some of the mental health challenges. That said, most programs these days are should be offering um, treatment, co-occurring treatment, so substance use and mental health. They should be. That's been happening for 25 years where we've tried to merge those two and most substance use programs do address mental health as well but i know it's not all over so hope that gives you a little bit of an idea we'll wait and see if there's any more questions i have a question um, sure. you mentioned this multiple times about the shame and guilt um, and i was struck by the quote uh, i think it was in a patient in regard to a nurse and the, the, the woman and the mom felt like the nurse was sort of saying in front of her on purpose, um, shaming things. Given that this audience is a lot of child welfare workers and students who will be child welfare social workers, do you have suggestions um, for uh, strategies, words that are helpful related to um, not dismissing the truth, but also not adding to shame and guilt? Great question, great question, Alan. I, you know, we don't, there's no need whatsoever to add to any bad feelings that a mom might have about what she's done. So there's never a need to say anything to draw attention to the difficulties of the baby that might be in conjunction with the mom, because these moms know this in a visceral way, right? In their hearts, in their guts, in their, they know it really, really well. I think the best thing to do is to really um, know, to be curious, to ask open questions, and to listen to how the moms feel in a really non-judgmental way, and in just you know a really supportive non-judgmental way. That um, so there is a, there's no prescription or there's no. Um, and I'm thinking, what could that nurse have said? I'm trying to stick with that situation for a second and. And you know, the mom was very primed, obviously. The nurse could probably have said very little because the mom was like anything the nurse said, she would feel blamed, right? But the nurse probably could have said, ask the mom, how do you think the baby's doing? Right? As opposed to going over to the baby saying, Oh, poor baby, you know, you're having a hard time because you're withdrawing, right? So she might have gone into the room and said, How do you think your baby's doing? So uh, in empowering the mom to begin to think about her baby, to take the, keep the baby in mind. And I think in child welfare, um, it, it would be a lot the same to help the mom to think about what does she think is going on with the baby. And if they happen to be on a visit and the baby's upset, to be able to ask the mom what she thinks. So again, there's never a need as far as I'm concerned to point out to a mom that a baby is having a difficult time because it's almost always that the mom thinks that she's done something wrong and that's why the baby's having a difficult time. Thank you. Um, we do have another question. In terms of the typical parenting classes not meeting the needs of this population, what would you suggest if resources such as Bright are not readily available in our communities to best meet the needs and empower these mothers? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, <laughs> um, you know, we I can send Alice the paper that we did in um, that we published in Children Youth Services Review that sort of looks at these interventions specifically with an eye to child welfare. And so, one thing I would say is ask for them. Um, you know, ask say, hey, I hear that in Connecticut, in New Jersey, in Massachusetts, you know, they're doing these. Connecticut has an amazing program called Family Based Recovery that you can read about that actually is funded by child welfare where they have substance use and infant mental health services in the home. So there's models out there. So I would say, on the one hand, advocate for policy change and for programmatic change. There's lots of good ways to work with um, families in, you know, there's not just one program. And so I would say, um, try to make the changes. That said, I know that like, you know, that may not happen tomorrow. Um, I think as a, um, I would probably work with a family and uh, you know, ask them how the parenting classes are going and whether they feel like they're learning something or whether it's working for them. 
um, you know, not assuming that a parenting six sessions in a parenting class is going to, you know, check off of the services plan. And so talk to them about it, you know, engage in conversations about what they think is working, what isn't working. And so, and use your assessment skills to see, is this something that's, you know, making a difference? And maybe take, yeah, I think that this kind of work within child welfare could happen if particularly with, you know, master's trained social workers that, or even bachelor's trained social workers, this work can happen by lots of different people. So I think um, you can get trained in some of these interventions as well. My short order policy change, it's gotta happen. Looks like we have reached the end of our questions, unless anyone else quick adds one. I think that that is it. Okay. Great. Well, I know that um, I speak for the audience, uh, Professor Paris, and just really wanting to reiterate what an informative and inspiring way this was to end the day and the week. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for all of our participants here. We had a great um, large audience who are interested in this really important topic. And just want to give you, uh, Dr. Professor Paris, just a huge message of gratitude. Uh, your work is really changing the landscape for mothers and for children and for families. And so we just appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you so much for having me. I, I wish I could see you all and, you know, <laughs> more of a, a little more of a dialogue, but I, I realized it's kind of hard with, well, there were 150 people at the beginning, so it's a lot of people to do that with, but I, I, I appreciate your being here. I appreciate the opportunity to share the work of, um, you know, myself, my, my colleagues, and generally, you know, the direction that we're hopefully moving in to help these, um, moms and dads we've had probably you know 15 or 20 dads over time who participated and um yeah so thank you again for being here and for the chance to share thank you uh, lots of messages of gratitude in the uh, q a uh, for you professor paris uh, a question about um accessing access to the PowerPoint, which I can talk with Professor Paris about, and we have everyone's email addresses. So when we send out the CEUs, if there's materials um, that are available, we'll send those along as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again.